Okay, we want to get started, please. Duh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought this meeting was at 10. As long as we all are. I've been there once. Okay, we have one public speaker, Mr. Coffer, and he is a high school student. Oh my God, look how cute you are. Right there, sweetie. <laughs> He's cute. Can I start? Please. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of uh, proposals for restructuring a lot of uh, services. Um, I uh, suggested combining the X27 and X28 on weekends and have it run down Shore Road and across 86th Street, and it would probably improve over the current configuration of having two uh, separate routes, and it would, it would, it would improve over um, eliminating it totally on weekends. And I also suggested um, having uh, certain outbound express routes in the outer boroughs pick up uh, passengers because the local service may not be as good in that area. So some people might be willing to pay the extra 325 for the fare if it meant that they could get to wherever they're going quicker. And uh, uh, make the M7 a limited bus between West 106th Street and West 72nd Street. Um, the, the same way like the M5 is like during the day only limited buses run, it would be the same thing with the M7. Uh, the M101 between 125th Street Amsterdam Avenue and Amsterdam Avenue and Broadway because the M100 would offer the local service in the in the along uh, Amsterdam Avenue. Um, add some limited stop B60 service um, because it's a long uh, route, so uh, limited stops usually work good on uh, longer routes. Uh, the B15, the locals could terminate at the uh, Brooklyn General Mail facility, and then the limiteds could go out to JFK Airport. Uh, the BX19 because it goes it's a it's a frequent route running from um, the West West Harlem to uh, the Bronx Botanical Gardens and the uh, BX21 and the uh, BX31 could also use limited stop service and the Q30 along uh, Utopia Parkway because the Q31 offers parallel local service and uh, once again that could improve the running time and so it's the same thing with the the B82 and the Q58, where their logic was that um, it would increase uh, passengers and increase revenue. The same logic would work there. Uh, Q54 during rush hours. The uh, on weekends the S61 uh, could run limited on Victory Boulevard uh, because the S62 offers the parallel local service, and both buses are running to meet the same. Uh, ferry, so there's no point in having two local buses. You might as well make one limited. What you say? Uh, the S79 along What's Highland Boulevard Minion? between Clove and Clove Road and Richmond Avenue, because the S because uh, the plans for select bus service um, have the uh, S79 running as limited, but all the it, it will be the only corridor that will go from local to select bus service in one step. All like the M15, the B44, all already have. Uh, Limited service. The um, extend the S89 to Tottenville and cut back the S59 because the S89 will probably be more attractive because it's already a limited. Whereas the S and it goes out to New Jersey. Whereas the 
S-59 is only local and it goes only within Staten Island. And then have some M-5s terminate at the Houston Street because since it's a long route, it will go from one end of Manhattan to the other. It will be very delay prone, so this would kind of cut back on the possibility of delays in lower Manhattan. Um, maintain weekend M-50 service because there will be no crosstown service between 42nd and 57th because uh, the M-27 is also being eliminated. Uh, combine the B-71 with either the B-69 along Vanderbilt Avenue or with the B-14 coming from Crown Heights. Uh, maintain off-peak B-4 service because the, the numbers in the revised report show there will be, that it's a lot more efficient. It's the half the savings are the re savings are reduced by 50 percent, but the customer impact is only reduced by 20 percent. So it would make more sense to to keep off peak service too. Uh, maintain B64 service to Coney Island because um, a lot of people would be discouraged because they would have to transfer the B82, and that would hurt ridership along uh, the Bath Avenue portion. Oh, thank you. Um, combine the B39 with B24, and um, uh, because it, there's uh, the Delancey Street station is isn't ADA accessible, uh, maintain either B65 or B45 service uh, overnight. Uh, extend the Q46 some of the trips to cover for the Q79. Uh, maintain weekend Q76 service. Uh, maintain overnight BX34 service or add overnight service to BX16 because Woodlawn is very isolated. Um, extend the BX-16 to Fordham Road, Valentine Avenue to replace the BX-34 on weekends. Extend the 57, S-57 on Sun Island to Ebbets Street, Cedar Grove Avenue to compensate for the loss of the 76. Run the new S-66 on weekends because the 54 and the 60 are both being eliminated on weekends. So if you added the weekend service, it would, um, it would so solve the problems for both the riders. Uh, we route the 61 and 91 to Manor Road instead of Bradley Avenue. Excuse me, Mr. Coffer. I am I'm not interrupting you because we're going to. Here I am. Oh, oh. I knew you were looking. I'm not interrupting you because we're trying to avoid your suggestions. It's just we have a, a lot to do. So what? And we can't give you answers right now, obviously. Yes. So and and it's also obvious that you've. We can give them answers on everyone, right? I mean, so, some of. But yeah, but some of the well, I'd love to look at different things. Yeah, I mean, some of the savings he may have you thought of. It. That's what we. Yeah. He has a yeah, he's gonna give his copy in. Can we hire him? Yeah. <laughs> Norman. So, Norman, so before, Norman, uh, watch before out. We, yeah, um, give it to you. Before Mr. Coffer, we're still talking to you. Before we offer you an internship here, uh, um, give us some time, and maybe you can submit your email address or. Um, or okay. a phone number or something, and we can. We might not be able to address every single suggestion, but we could take a sample of them and give you our thoughts on them. Okay, okay so thank you. I, it must have been quite a You're research welcome. project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there are not any changes to the work plan. Oh, I'd like to approve the minutes of the last meeting. I make a motion the minutes be Okay, all approved. And there are not any changes to the um, work plan. Um, there is an information item that's been added to the work plan. There's Tom? One information item, which is the fall 2010 New York City Transit bus schedule changes, which also appeared in the New York City Transit Committee. This item will be addressed when we get to the service change section at the end. Okay. Joe? Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairperson Chevelle, the members of the committee. I'd like to turn it over to John Hine, uh, who's our Vice President, Chief of Transportation Oper Operations, and let him give us the operations report. John? Good morning. Uh, we'll start with the performance highlights for the month of April. Um, combined bus MDBF uh, was up 6.3% in April 2010 compared to last year's levels uh, in April. Long Island bus, the performance improved by 88.2% over a year ago. The combined 12-month average MDBF uh, through April 2010 was up slightly a half of a percent compared to the prior 12-month average. 
April bus service performance was relatively strong. Combined AM weekday pullouts were at 98.77%, and combined PM weekday pullouts out at 99.10% for the month of April. For the previous 12 months, combined AM weekday pullouts were 99.43%, and the combined PM weekday pullouts were 99.65%. Completed trips were 98.04% for the month of April, and 98.86 for the previous 12 months. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Steve Vidal for the safety uh, portion. Our safety highlights for the uh, month of April are as follows. Overall, the 12-month rate for combined bus collisions per million miles traveled improved by 2% from last year across the three bus units. Similarly, the 12-month rate for bus collision injuries per million miles improved by 6.6%. The 12-month rate for customer accidents rose 7.7% over the 12-month period, and the rate for customer accident injuries also increased by 4.5% over that period. However, both of these categories reflected improvements in March 2010 over March 2009. Customer accidents improved by 5.4% over March 2009, and customer accidents improved by 4.2% over 2009. The 12-month rate for employee on-duty lost time accidents worsened by 16.4% from the 2009 levels. Similarly, customer accidents, similar to customer accidents, the lost time accident level for the month of March was actually 25% better than March of 2009. I'll turn it over to Tom Charles. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. Access ride uh, paratransit ridership increased 10.2% for the month of April. Able Ride was down 2.7 compared to April 2009 levels. For the most recent 12-month period through April 2010, paratransit ridership continues to increase over the prior 12-month period. Accessor Ride was up 14.1 percent, and Able Ride was up 1.6 percent. However, when compared to 2010 adopted budget levels, Accessor Ride ridership was lower than the budget by 4.8 percent and Able Ride ridership was lower by budget by 1.5 percent for the year to date through April. Paratransit fare box revenue for Accessor Ride was worse than the adopted budget by 4.3 percent for the month of April. It is 5.2 percent lower than the budget for the year to date. Able Ride fare box revenue was on budget for the month of April. It is 1.4 percent better than budgeted levels for the year to date through April. Requests for service in April increased by 9.2 percent for Accessor Ride and decreased 2.8 percent for Able Ride compared to April 2009. For the 12-month average, requests for service increased 14.2 percent for Accessor Ride and 2.8 percent for Able Ride. Trips completed were up by 10.9 percent for Accessor Ride and down 2.6 percent for Able Ride in April 2010 when compared to April 2009. For the last 12 months, completed trips were up 13.7 percent for Accessor Ride and 3 percent for Able Ride when compared to the prior 12-month period. The favorable trend regarding passenger no-shows as a percentage of scheduled trips continued for Accessor Ride in April as there were 25.9 percent fewer no-shows compared to last year. However, Able Ride passenger no-shows increased by 10.8 percent in April 2010 compared to April 2009. As requested at our May meeting, a brief update has been prepared for the Committee on the status of Accessor Ride initiatives underway to contain costs and improve the efficiency of operations. To my left is the MTA's Chief Operating Officer, Charles Monheim, who will present this update. I am going to send the report to Jeff, um, and we're going to set the – waiting for the um, presentation to appear on the board right now. I would suggest you do that. Okay. Yep. Good morning. Ridership levels appear to have stabilized slightly below adopted budget levels. Two, uh, total fixed route ridership decreased slightly for April by two-tenths of one percent in comparison to April 2009. 
For the 12-month period, total ridership was down 3.5 percent as compared to the previous 12 months. Year-to-date, MTA bus ridership is two-tenths of one percent below adopted budget. Long Island bus is 1.2 percent better than budget year-to-date, and the Department of Buses is 2.1 percent lower than budget. Combined average weekday ridership was up 1.5 for the month of April, but down 3.4 for the 12-month period. And average weekend ridership was down 3.3 in April and 4.4 for the full 12-month period. I'll go, if we, if we can, I'll go right into finance then until they're ready. Yeah, but Joe, in our pre-meeting, you mentioned about ridership being up. Yeah, weekday ridership is up across all three companies. On, the, it, on local bus. On the local um, bus. It's not express. That yeah. pulls us down. Okay. It, the weekend ridership is what's down. It's what's really pulling us okay. down, too. Weekend in general, right? Weekend no, weekday in local is up. Yeah. Weekend in, in, weekend in lo and local is, is I'm, I'm not sure, I'll tell you the truth. I, 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 I think we just have it for the weekend as a category, both local we and want it more specific. Weekend is down, Andrew, overall. And, and the vast driver of it is, yeah, it, it's primarily local is down too, though, because you can't pull that much down on express. There's not much express on the weekend. Yeah, weekend. it's lighter. Okay, yeah. Are you, Charles, are you okay if we, are you ready now or do you want us to keep rocking? Okay. Okay. We'll do the finance report. Preliminary financial results for fixed route fare box revenue for April 10 was 4.9% was better than the adopted budget for MTA bus, 1.3% better for New York City transit bus, and 5% better than the adopted budget for Long Island bus. Year to date, MTA bus is 3.7% better than the adopted budget for fare box revenue. Long Island bus is 1.4% better than budget, and the Department of Buses is essentially on budget. In the expense side of the house, for accrued non-reimbursable expenses before any cash adjustments, non-cash adjustments, year-to-date MTA bus is 217 better than the adopted budget. Long Island bus is $1.4 million better than adopted budget levels. And New York City Transit bus non-reimbursable expenses with $33 million better than budget for year-to-date. Combined through April, the underrun for the three bus units, including paratransit operations, is $56 million or 6% below the adopted budget levels. Now, as I think we mentioned last month, some of it's timing, but a significant chunk of it is the fact that we have lower spending and we have over 600 vacant positions now by the end of April in anticipation of the additional budget reductions coming in the second half of 2010. That's it for finance. How often we get, I mean, I hate to say this is good news, but it is good, it's, it's good news. I mean, it's, it's a shame why, but it's still um, the outcome we need for now. So, okay. Um, now, Charles? Ready? Okay. Um, at the last meeting, the um, uh, board member Kay asked for an update on um, the state of paratransit initiatives and our cost reduction efforts. So I'm going to provide you with that update today. Um, basically, there are two uh, parts to this presentation. First of all, just reminding the board members of the context within which paratransit exists in, um, in New York City, and then second, talking more specifically about the initiatives we have underway. Uh, just a reminder, the uh, uh, American with Disabilities Act of 1990 is designed to provide a, a, a comparable to fixed route service for those people who are disabled. Those, disa those disabilities may be uh, permanent disabilities. They may also be temporary disabilities. The MTA has been operating this service under an agreement with the City of New York since 1993. Um, and one aspect of that operation is that the fare that's being charged to uh, those people who use the service is the same fare as the, uh, fare, the base fare being charged on subways and buses. The service parameters are basically meant to uh, mimic that provided for those people using the fixed route service. Uh, it's a uh, origin to destination service. That service can be provided either with paratransit vehicles or 
uh, a combination of paratransit vehicles and the uh, feeding those people onto the fixed route service that we have to the extent that it's accessible. The service requirements are that we have to provide service within three quarters of a mile of our fixed network. What that effectively means is that we are providing service to all destinations within New York City um, and where applicable uh, three quarters of a mile into um, uh, Nassau County and Westchester counties. The uh, service is provided either on a subscription basis or through reservations that are made the day before. Um, and we have uh, performance targets that we not exceed um, uh, late pickups uh, over and above a 10 percent limit, that we provide that service within a time frame that is comparable to our fixed route service. In other words, uh, we can't provide a service where we drive around the city picking up people and then progressively drop them off to the extent that that would exceed the kind of service that somebody using the fixed route network would expect to receive. Uh, and we plan our service on the basis that we will deny nobody who wants to make a reservation access to the system. Andrew? Um, if the slide could just go back one. Yeah. Um, who, who in the organization or anywhere determines whether when somebody calls um, for a trip to a doctor's or wherever they have to go, that that there is, in fact, a part of their route available via our regular transit system and accessible subways and or buses. Who makes that determination? Well, currently very little of that determination is being done. Um, and if uh, I'll get into this a little later. Oh, sorry. But, but basically, uh, we are developing software that will allow those determinations to be made at the time the person is making the reservation. But let's hold that question for a minute if that's okay. It's worth noting that um, uh, since 1993, a lot of progress has been made on making the MTA's system more accessible. Every single bus provided by New York City Transit, MTA bus, and Long Island bus is now accessible. And in addition, there are 88 accessible subway stations. The one purpose, I think one uh, uh, Subtext to the uh, desire for this presentation is the fact that uh, paratransit service is a growing cost for transit systems across the United States. Um, in 2008, paratransit service was costing uh, about $2.9 billion, and those costs have been going up at a rate that exceeds that uh, for the fixed rate, the, the fixed route network. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, operating expenses, passenger trips, revenue miles are all um, increasing at rates that are significantly above those for the fixed rate, fixed route network. It's also worth noting that um, New York City, uh, with a system that now has an expense of something on the order of half a billion dollars, accounts for something on the order of one-sixth of the nationwide expenditure on paratransit service. Um, and it's also worth noting um, that the uh, subsidy that we are paying for paratransit service now comes in at about the same subsidy that we are paying for the Metro North Commuter Railroad. The point being that paratransit, which was a very small operation um, in the early 90s when the legislation was passed and when uh, the MTA took this over, is no longer a small operation. It is a major operation in its own right um, and needs to be managed and its costs controlled um, in a manner consistent with that status. Uh, the next two slides will just give you some, uh, some more specific information about that. As you can see, uh, paratransit costs have been escalating um, uh, since uh, the early 90s. We've now reached the point where uh, the cost is increasing by approximately $70 million a year, or at least would have um, based on the uh, 2010 financial plan as originally conceived. Um, and much of this cost is driven by growth in the number of passenger trips. 
So um, as part of the uh, 2010 budget, which was passed in December, uh, we made commitments to significantly reduce the cost of paratransit service. A uh, $40 million reduction was slated for 2010 and an $80 million reduction slated for 2011. So I think the question is how are we uh, achieving those targets? Uh, one of the first things that uh, Tom Prendergast did when he became president of New York City Transit was to encourage a peer review to be conducted um, through APTA uh, by other properties that, are, that also have paratransit service. Um, that was carried out in March, and there were three very cogent rec recommendations. First of all, that we try to use other uh, services, whether it's taxis, black cars, or, or livery services, uh, which generally have a uh, cost that will be lower than our own service cost, and that by uh, improving the mix of services, we can significantly reduce the cost of operating paratransit service. Second, that we be more diligent about um, ensuring that we're only providing those trips that are eligible for paratransit service. And finally, uh, since we do have a, a, uh, a network that is accessible, certainly on the bus side, that we make much better use of that fixed route network uh, to carry uh, passengers where possible. So with regard to the um, first recommendation, um, we are uh, attempting to move from our current situation of roughly 9% of trips being uh, covered by taxis and, and livery services to a target of 20% in 2011. Um, <coughs> Part of what needs to be done to achieve this is making the, the service both more attractive to uh, paratransit users and also to the taxi and livery services. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, among the things we're doing are pilots with both the taxi industry and with the um, car services. The goal of the taxi pilot is to uh, reduce the need for those people who are willing to use taxi services to have to pay up front. We're doing this by providing them with a, um, a card that will uh, provide pre-funding of trips. In other words, uh, the person will pay the amount that would be required to basically the fare for a paratransit trip. We will pre-authorize trips, and then the customer will use that card to, uh, for those trips, uh, and we will directly reimburse the uh, taxi operator for the difference. So the uh, taxi user doesn't have to fund it up front uh, and then get reimbursed uh, eight or ten days later. Similarly, with regard to the car services, one of the significant issues is the administration that the, um, that the car service providers experience in working with us. And we're uh, working now uh, with a number of brokers to try to um, make that a less onerous process and to increase the willingness of car services to want to work with us and to provide paratransit trips. Second, as I mentioned, we want to ensure that we are only providing those trips that we are required to um, provide. Um, and paratransit has done a lot of work to analyze its trips. As I mentioned earlier, to some extent, um, uh, the use of paratransit can be a permanent um, entitlement. It can also be temporary. But on top of that, the requirement, um, the eligibility can be uh, full or it can be conditional. In other words, um, a conditionally eligible person may be required to actually walk some distance. Um, uh, and what we've identified is the fact that almost half of the people who are currently using paratransit <clears throat> are, in fact, conditional, uh, conditionally eligible. And were we to have better means for uh, identifying that conditional eligibility and understanding that conditional eligibility in relation to the trip being taken, we could make much better use of our fixed network. In fact, um, in 2010, 
uh, we could probably reduce some portion of over 3 million trips a year um, by using the knowledge of conditional eligibility. Next. In order to understand what that will actually save us in 2010 and 2011, uh, Paratransit has done some simulations by looking at its uh, 2009 trips, um, viewing those 2009 trips through the lens of what that trip was and what the conditional eligibility was, and it's our estimation that over the next two years we can probably uh, funnel up to a quarter of all trips um, either entirely or partially into the fixed route network. Given that a trip costs something on the order of um, $60 a trip, um, the ability to reduce, to change that to a trip that costs us either um, $2.25 or a trip that costs us a shorter uh, paratransit trip to feed that into the network provides, as you can see from this slide, a substantial opportunity to control our costs. Andrew? Um. What I saw your chart on um, conditional eligibility um, a few slides back. What percentage of users of the paratransit system are wheelchair users? Do you know that? Tom, do you yeah, know? Yeah, about 30 percent. So, so when you talk about the conditional eligibility, you are excluding the, pretty much the wheelchair users. Yes, generally they're in the fully eligible status, not the condition. There are some wheelchair users, however, that are conditional, but it's very insignificant percentage. So you're, are you talking about people utilizing walkers, for instance, in the conditional eligibility? Some. Some that need uh, some mobility assistance, uh, but can take local trips, but may need assistance for long distance trips. And then there's some, obviously, who, who could use buses, but couldn't negotiate steps in any possible Correct. way, right? Correct. Do you know what percentage though that, that is by any chance? Well, of the, uh, no, we don't have it broken down into their abilities, just conditional eligibility distance, or Interboro tells me that's the subway difficulty in that, uh, navigating the subway. Right. Um, so the objective, obviously, is to move people to the bus system as, as much as we can. Right. Um, it's uh, ironic, but um, come June 27th, we're about to remove two buses that would take people into borough and, you know, the subways aren't accessible to replace that. So that's kind of ironic in, in this scheme of things, the B-51 and the B-39. But Tom, I'm, I'm con oh, go ahead. I, th I, think, I think it's worth noting that um, the subways do have some accessibility in the, the 88 stations that you're talking about, and that um, buses are, in fact, wheelchair accessible. So that as a, as a flat rule, um, I, I, I think that the, the n none of these filters are exactly right. I guess it's just the... Not, not exactly, but yeah. um, uh, it's also worth noting that there are... Um, in 2009, there were approximately 1.3 million uses of the uh, lifts and uh, ramps on the buses. So um, these are used extensively for uh, people who may not even be eligible for uh, ADA trips, but nevertheless have mobility impairments uh, of some sort. Okay. Um, uh, Joe, one, one more thing before you continue. Sure. Over here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the three-quarter mile, is this a, a radius of where the person is, or is it three-quarters of a mile to get them to another transit facility? It's a, the obligation is to provide paratransit service within three-quarters of a mile of the fixed route network. Okay, so somebody could be picked up and taken a half of a mile to a bus station or to a train station. Is that how it works? That three-quarters of a mile, is it... No, the three quarters is just defining the service area of uh, the paratransit where door-to-door -door service would be provided. All right. So but if you if someone has to go from their, their an an answer home to, your question, to a hospital and it's a mile, right? That's not going to work. Right. In answer to your question, though, the law also says we need to establish a cross-jurisdictional transfer point with uh, other paratransit agencies okay. uh, on our border. So that's what would. Uh, 
take care of the uh, distance beyond the three-quarter mile. So we would meet another carrier. Okay. Correct. Thank Correct. you. But, but also it's worth noting that by virtue of the fact that we operate a 24-hour service, we have a um, more significant paratransit obligation than those systems that shut down. Uh, so you are you are only obligated to provide service during your service hours within three quarters of a mile of your fixed network. Okay, finally, um, the third point was that we need to reduce our cost of operating our service more generally. There have been a number of initiatives underway. Most notably, we are uh, eliminating the uh, contracts with those operators who are the highest cost operators and redistributing those trips to our lower cost operators. Um, and we're also doing a number of things to either optimize our schedules or better optimize our schedules or uh, improve productivity in other ways. Um, with the uh, result uh, on the next slide that, um, as you can see, our we're beginning to make progress in both cutting the growth in the number uh, or the rate of growth of trips and also beginning to drive down the cost of trips per se. Um, the, the sum total of this is that we will approach achieving the $40 million but may not uh, fully achieve that in 2010, but we are confident that we will fully achieve the $80 million reduction in 2011, um, and there are any number of uh, efforts underway um, to make sure that we do that. Questions or comments? How far short will we fall in 2010 or go? The sense is that we may be uh, sort of somewhere between 8 and $10 million short in 2010. Um, that's primarily due to the time it's taking to develop the software to both handle the conditional, the, well, primarily it's due to the time that it's taking to fully develop the software to fully um, incorporate the conditional eligibility decisions into the scheduling decisions we're making um, at the time people call into our um, call center. And do, do we have a database on who our cohort population is and what their needs are? For example, when someone calls in uh, and it's a fairly regular customer, do we know, uh, are they somehow identified by their eligibility and what their normal trips are so that we can create a database that has real efficacy? Yes, they are, uh, first they're uh, referred to as a registrant. We know what their uh, specific conditions are. And our reservation uh, software is already capturing routine trips so that we have that come up on the screen automatically. We're not going through, we're very conscious of trying to keep the call center cost down as well. So try to store as much data about a profile about each customer and then integrate this with the uh, fixed route software. One about about bringing people to to the transit system to to the bus, would that be on on one side of the trip or both sides of the trip? In other words, someone be picked up at their home, brought to a bus stop, I assume, they get on the bus, and then would that that bus would then stop supposedly close to their destination? Is that yes. the that's the thinking? It wouldn't be like <laughs> you'd you'd be left someplace, and then you'd have to get another trip from there to your destination. Well, you might. Well, that's what I'm wondering. You very well, well might. But, but the, the, the law still says origin to destination. Even if we include feeder, we have to be conscious of origin right. to destination. Right, yeah, I, I, that's right. So, so we're taking the approach right now is on the front leg, getting them from a home to a bus stop. Right. And then as we develop the software and learn more, we'll be looking at the, the end of the destination to see what assistance we need to provide. We're looking for those where the, the bus brings them right to their destination. At this time, right. right. And then you, you, you even think in the future to do yes. that, that. That's okay. Thank you. I, this is a very general comment. Since I've been knocking around here, um, with the exception of the major, the challenges of the major capital construction projects, I think the paratransit situation here has been the first and foremost largest challenge and um, we're, we're fortunate that you are addressing it and trying to uncover some way to lower the expenses but I also 
they will never get noted past this room because nothing positive about the MTA never gets past this room. But um, it, it, it would be, at least for us to feel comfortable with the fact of how many people, disabled people, every single day. I don't think there's probably a, a country in, in the world that addresses their disabled people like we do in terms of um, allowing them to be able to be mobile. That's it. Okay, so there are no, I was searching in my book for procurements, and there are no procurements. Um, before we do service change, this is just a very small request. When you're doing your presentations, can you just tell us what page to turn to? Thank you, because we no longer pay for tabs, so that's good. Um, now, Norm Silverman is going. Sorry, Nancy, I'm sorry. What? Charles, did you, did you ever answer the question I asked you earlier, which you said you'd get to later, which was who sits who determines whether there's accessible routes for, you said a computer is going to do it, and then you said you would address it more later. But well, yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't. Uh, huh? But I hoped I had, but. Uh, so software is underway. Yeah, the, so software is being developed that will allow the reservation agents to understand uh, whether they should be scheduling this person for a feeder trip or a trip that the person should be taking uh, solely through the fixed route network or whether uh, they will get some degree or uh, full paratransit service. I mean, M Mark Page and I were just having a little discussion about how many transfers of a bus, of a, of a regular city bus, do you think or would somebody think would be all right for a wheelchair-bound passenger, hypothetically, to use before they say, that's too many changes. You might as well use the uh, the accessor ride system. Well, I think basically that will be defined by the expected duration of the trip, understanding that we have an obligation for that trip to take no longer by uh, this means than it would by somebody using the fixed network themselves. If that's a if that's the criteria, I think I think the uh, you know. <laughs> That's not going to change very many minds. I mean, if you have to wait for three buses, hypothetically, versus one accessoride vehicle, I, I, I don't know how that could possibly win. Well, it, it has to do with what a, what a normal, what a, a person who... Who is ambulatory. A, yes. How long it would take him on the Is that what you were saying? Correct. Oh. Correct. Oh, okay. It's, the, it's the, the trip that would be taken by an ambulatory person, and if that involves three changes... And the amount of time that takes, we are not under an obligation to provide a superior service to that. Okay. We are under an obligation to provide a comparable service to that. So there, there has to be, even if it means 12 changes, hypothetically, a route like an ambulatory, would, and then you're an under no obligation to provide the accessor ride for that part. Correct. However, having said that, the, you know, the sort of logistical consideration, that's not where we're starting. Sure. We're starting with the, uh, the easiest trips. We'll see how that goes. Of course. And then we'll develop the system as we go along. Got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, first of all, in response to your request, we're starting on page 43 of the agenda. <laughs> Although there are five specific service adjustment staff summaries included in the printed agenda as information items, as was noted in the Transit Committee, um, two of these, both relating to changes in the Flushing Central Business District, are being removed from the agenda due to very recent issues raised by NYC DOT, and we have to work a lot more with them on some issues that are outstanding. Of the remaining three items, one is for MTA bus, one is for Long Island bus, and one is for New York City Transit Department of Buses. I'll list them all as follows. First is the QBX1 consolidation for MTA bus. The second is a very minor change in Long Island Bus's N19 travel path in the eastern end of its route in Babylon. The third is the consolidation of Bronx Concourse limited stop service in the BX1 and provision of all local service in the BX2 on weekdays and Saturdays. Um, in addition, the committee work plan was revised to include at its information the fall 2010 bus schedule changes for New York City Department of Buses. 
The staff summary for these schedule changes relates to normal business changes that are planned for implementation this September. They are based upon ridership checks and routine application of loading guidelines. These schedule changes are not affected by the 2010 budget-based service reduction. Specifically, no service changes in this package are on routes that are in the service, change, service reduction program or that would be affected by the absence or restructuring of a route that is in that package. Details of all are contained in the staff summaries in the book starting on page 43, and we are prepared to answer any questions that members of the committee may have on any of these. Just one quick one on the uh, Co-op City Flushing service. How far in advance are you putting signs up to let people know that the QBX1 is now the Q50 or the BX23 or whatever? Well, first of all, this is happening, this is happening in the fall, Andrew. It's, okay. It was deliberately not happening with the service changes. There are other changes in co-op cities, part of transit's changes. We deliberately are not doing it as part of that. Right. We will let them know very aggressively. We've already met with the community board up there. They know about the change. In fact, they want us to go up there and meet with their co-op city reps, which we will do. We're waiting for them to pick a date. Um, we will let them know in the normal process, and uh, invariably there will be someone who says, I still don't know, but we're going to do it very, very aggressively. I think the routes you've chosen are really excellent, and, the, and avoiding the double looping back to Pelham Bay Station is, is very, very smart. We think so, and we're very enthused about the limited component of the Q50, which is where the yeah. market growth we think will occur. Thanks. We have some flies to put up on buses, and we're going to do that after the community meetings. Okay. okay. Any further questions about service changes? Any questions or comments about anything now? Okay. I um, need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Steve.